Hello and welcome. You are watching Lockdown TV. This is the pop-up news and discussion channel from unheard.com. Um, during these strange and anxious-making lockdown weeks, um, we have been bringing some of our contributors and thinkers and people that we're lucky enough to uh, spend time with to bring a discussion together about what this all means for the country and what it might mean going forward. Um, today, on Good Friday, I am lucky enough to be joined by Andrew Lord Adonis. Give us a wave, Andrew. Are you there? Hi, Freddie. Hi. Um, yes. um, so, so, the topic today is the big one, basically. You know, we're, it's a, another one of these surreal weeks where it sort of feels hopeful and sunny outside, and then we're actually all still anxiously locked inside our houses for most of the time. Um, and there's a, a kind of the beginnings of, a after some very anxious making first couple of weeks, there's the beginnings of a serious policy and political discussion about what the proper response to this new threat should be and what's sustainable long term. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, well, it's a desperate uh, situation without precedent, really. We're looking at uh, national income, which could be a third down uh, uh, over the full first month of the lockdown compared to the equivalent month last year, which is utterly without precedent. We're also dealing with a, a, a health emergency and a health care emergency, which is also in its own way without precedent. And um, on the medical side, I suspect the thing is, is much worse than people think too, because it's quite clear that this virus started in China. And it's also clear that there was massive state lying and cover-up that took place in the in this vital period when the virus incubated and spread. I mean, the, the figures that are being published by the, the Chinese uh, state machine are clearly fabrications. So we're dealing with what was a really very, very serious medical emergency before it even reached us. And of course, our response to it, which has been, I think, entirely appropriate, which is to prevent uh, uh, an unsustainable um, health uh, emergency has been to do what is also without precedent, which is a lockdown. So, so the big question going forward is how do we at one and the same time deal with the health emergency whilst enabling some semblance of normal economic life to return? And everyone is wrestling with this at the moment. And let's be absolutely clear, this is an art, not a science. Getting the judgments right on is going to be very, very difficult. And we're all learning from uh, what each other is doing in terms of countries. Uh, all of the Western countries, where of course we have freedom of expression and we can exchange real facts mm. as to what's going on, which I'm afraid doesn't include China, unfortunately. We're all wrestling with this together. And we're all having moved in the direction of lockdown. Some move faster than others, some move more completely than others. You and I, Freddie, have, uh, have, uh, have been looking at the situation in Sweden where there wasn't such a hard yeah. lockdown to start with. Some have gone even harder than we have. You know, my family, part of my family lives in Paris where you're not even allowed to go jogging yeah. now and you're liable to be stopped if you go out into the streets. So yeah. well, we've all been moving in roughly the same direction and we're all now engaging in a debate about how we can start getting back to some semblance of normal economic life once we have got the health capacity needed, the testing in place, which is absolutely vital to ensuring that, uh, that people are healthy who are participating in uh, ordinary uh, social uh, behaviour, and how we actually start bringing these elements together. But bringing them together is going to be hugely important over the next few months, because if we don't do it successfully, we could be looking at an impact on our society, which is genuinely like a war in terms of the defamation clause, and, and we want to try and avoid that. Do you think, uh, I don't know if you agree, that what worries me is that there's a lot of kind of um, anxious and quite tense uh, thinking, um, and sometimes that the sort of clear thinking can be the can be sacrificed in periods like that. Um, you know, on the on the, the the lockdown itself, I'm still not clear what the actual sort of rationale or the objective for it is, um, because we, I don't think the government has been clear. You know, it was it simply to buy time, as they said originally, to expand capacity in the NHS so that we weren't having an overwhelmed health service. If, if that was the reason, that sort of offers a map towards 
when and how you might get out of it? Or was the objective of it to suppress the virus, which is, in other words, to you know, reach a point where we have no new transmissions, in which case it becomes much less clear how you get out of it. Do you have, have any sense of which of those is the stated purpose? Well, I obviously don't speak for the government, but it looks to me, looking at it as a, as a parliamentarian who's been engaged in all the debates, as if uh, um, what happened was uh, a real concern about the pressure on the health service, which then turned into deep alarm with the Imperial College paper. Yeah. Because what the Imperial College paper appear, appeared to show was that the rate of infection and the, uh, the transference of infection leading to admissions into hospital and the requirement for really serious medical interventions what had been really seriously underestimated. And on the basis of what, what had happened in Italy, which uh, it looked as if they were only just a, a few weeks ahead of us, this could be a totally unsustainable uh, position. Now, I, my own view at the time was that that was a, a, an, a, an adequate explanation because we can't have a situation where it's simply not possible in the health service to deal with, with people who are falling prey to this disease. Uh, but, of course, it does raise the issue as to what then is your next step. Mm. Once you have reached a peak, I see the latest phrase is flattening off, as I talked about flattening off. Once you've reached the peak and it's flattened off in a way that means your health service can cope. And that is the issue which... Uh, everyone internationally appears to be uh, uh, dealing with at the moment. Once you've got to the stage where you have some fair degree of confidence that with the additional health capacity you're putting in, the additional equipment you're putting in, the personal protective equipment you're putting in, all of those things, your health service can actually cope with the numbers who are coming through. Uh, then what is your next step? And it appears to me, taking stock of the debate, that the view then is that that alone isn't enough. What we've got to do is to, is, is to seek, so far as we reasonably can, to see the reopening social contact in an ordinary way, people going to school, people going to work, using public transport and so on, doesn't lead, even if we've got the additional health capacity, to a, 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 a big increase in the number of falling prey to the disease who will then become seriously ill, which is where the second stage of the policy kicks in, which is testing. And the big debate, it seems to me at the moment, is how possible is it to link the reopening of society to the mass extension of testing? Is it actually possible to make a direct link between the two, which is to say that you, in a sense, give people passports to be able to come back in based on having been tested? Or once you've got your health capacity in place, do you have enough security of what you know about the likelihood of different social groups, like children, to fall prey to it? Can you, as, alongside a big increase in testing, also move sooner rather than later other groups coming back in? Now, looking at what's happening internationally, it looks as if, with the measures announced over recent days by Denmark, by Austria, uh, the plan put in place by Germany, as if these two policies are proceeding in parallel. Mass testing plus a judgment as to whether you can go beyond that with, with social groups, uh, particularly younger children, the first few years of primary school, where it is safe to reopen social contact, even though you can't uh, extend testing to all those groups. There is a, um, there have been a couple of interesting studies that have come out in the past 24 hours. There's a a German report um, that looked at, uh, uh, had tested a sample of people, and uh, that particular professor came out with the figure of 0.37% fatality um, was his best estimate of, of what um, the coronavirus leads to. And in fact, a, a study in Iceland was also released that came to a similar kind of number. It looks increasingly possible, although we don't have all the information, that much larger numbers of people are infected or have been infected with a minor or asymptomatic, asymptomatic infection. Um, if that sort of number was true in the UK, we'd be looking at multiple millions, many millions, you know, somewhere on up to 10 million of people who have already had it or during this first phase. Um, where, I think where it gets, it's going to get really difficult sort of politically and from a policy point of view is if that's true, what do you then do? Because sort of the idea of containing it through testing 
at that point, once it's already been through such a big chunk of the population, it's going to look kind of difficult, mm. less convincing. But then it now it seems like to just let it pass through the whole population, the so-called herd immunity mm. approach is not going to fly politically mm. anyway. So is there, is there a chance that we get caught between two stools and then we sort of have no way out? Well, being, being very practical about it, I think two ways forward. The first, on the point about the whatever proportion it is of people who've already had it, this antibody test looks as if that may be a way forward there, which means you'll be, you can tell whether people have already developed uh, the immunity to it. But secondly, uh, always my, one of my cardinal principles of public policy is that R&D stands for rob and duplicate. And we have great good fortune in this case that some other countries, because they regard themselves as further through this in terms of, of, of uh, having reached and gone beyond the peak than we have, are already either looking at or starting policies of opening up. And I'm particularly, um, uh, I think, of particular significance to us is what's happening in Denmark and Austria with, with the move towards starting to open up. Yeah. So I don't think we need to take an absolutist approach. What is the absolute right thing? I think we are, are, are fortunate, since it's quite clear that the government is going to extend the, the, the lockdown next week. We're fortunate that over the next um, fortnight or so, because it, uh, when um, other countries start opening up their first years of primary school, we can see what happens. Mm. And I think we should be paying extremely close attention because both Austria and Denmark are starting to open up their primary schools after Easter. And we should study very carefully how they do it, what the impact is. And that could be a very important uh, precedent for us. Just as, of course, the lockdowns themselves, we were following other countries. So with the combination of the antibody test, if it's possible to do it reliably and at scale, plus observing very closely what countries are starting to open up, starting with the parts of the population who are clearly uh, uh, at least risk, I think that may offer us a way forward. Have you noticed um, uh, one thing I, I, I find concerning is that in, a lot of the debate seems to be almost cast as a kind of um, there's a the, the virtuous and moral uh, position should be towards you know not even questioning the sort of lockdown policy in a sense or it it should be you know to to ask questions about it or start putting the energy on how to lift it you then quite quickly get cast as a sort of utilitarian um, economistic kind of cold blooded type. Um, who is measuring lives against economics. And I just wonder if you have thoughts about that, because it seems like that's that's a, not a useful way to look at this question. Well, everyone who's sensible is looking at this, and let's leave aside some of the um, uh, the, the, the people who just sort of troll on Twitter, who mm. can often get a disproportionate voice in this. Everyone who's sensible realises that the impact is terrible on both sides. There's a terrible health impact, and we have to guard against that. But there's also a terrible economic and other health in, in, impacts that come from the lockdown. Uh, mental health, people's jobs, people's ability to, um, uh, to go to school and study. And what you've got to do is, is make a judgment based on them all. Now, I think one way of dealing with this, of course, as we've just been saying, is to look at what other people have been doing. Uh, I don't think anybody regards uh, Denmark, Austria, Germany and Sweden as somehow being cavalier with people's health. Uh, the, the country I do put in a separate place because they clearly aren't cavalier with the rights of the individual is China. And that's been a big, big problem all the way through dealing with this, is the systematic state lying and uh, policies which, uh, which are followed in China, which we couldn't in, uh, in any event follow, including, as we're talking about people behaving really improperly, uh, the victimisation of those people who blew the whistle on this at the beginning, which is absolutely... Mm. Uh, terrible when you think about it that, that one of the biggest global pandemics of recent times the people who, who tried to draw attention to it were themselves being victimised and, and, uh, and in some cases um, confined as a result so China's in a separate place but for the western countries that clearly isn't true the next stage I think on this is just as the government each day quite rightly gives an assessment of what's happening in health impacts terrible number who've died, the number who've been admitted to hospital and so on. I think they need to start quantifying what the economic and social impacts are. Mm. And I think in these uh, five o'clock briefings that we now have, 
which are the only form of real accountability or debate we've got at the moment, because uh, reprehensibly, even Parliament isn't meeting at the moment. I think that there should, at the beginning, uh, whichever minister is doing them, should say something about the government's latest assessments and findings of the economic damage that we're experiencing, the uh, non-NHS health impacts, as well as the health impacts, so we can put this in the broader picture and make available to the public at large all of the facts for which we're all wrestling in order to try and get to the right policy over the coming weeks. You get there, uh, I think it was in a Fraser Nelson column this morning that, that he reported that such those kind of models have already been being run in government and that he quoted a figure of 150,000 potential deaths uh, long term if this uh, from the sort of a uh, long-term impact. Um, now, I, I don't know where that figure came from, but, um, you know, he'd normally be well-sourced. Do you think those kind of models are appropriate? I mean, what you're comparing there is people who are literally dying now with, you know, quite speculative ideas about whether it's suicides or long-term health effects or, you know, people lost through an inferior health service that isn't funded properly and so on. Do you, do you think that's the approach you, we should be having? Uh, well, I think the government should publish what data it has gathered itself. Mm. I'm, I'm a believer in freedom of information in this area. Now, some elements of the data on the economic and social impact are absolutely incontrovertible. Numbers unemployed, numbers claiming um, various different sorts of you know, universal credit and various different sorts of Which benefits. Are already, already tragedies in themselves in a lot of those. N n numbers who are being furloughed, yeah. uh, what the actual economic effect is. And when it comes to the impact on, on, on mental health and, um, and uh, that, that part of, uh, of the health service, I think the government should simply publish what figures it has yeah. uh, and make them all available because uh, uh, you know, it's quite a phrase, we're, we're all in this together. If it comes to if it comes to a difficult choice, basically, if, 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 it, we know, if once we know much more about the disease and we know what sort of percentage of people have been affected, we are, as a society, then faced with the choice of either kind of running from it, in a sense, and trying to uh, clamp down or minimise or wait until maybe some future vaccine that might or might not arrive, in which case there'll be one sort of future ahead of us, which could last years, potentially, of... Um, you know, permanent social distancing, um, anxieties and so on, um, you know, versus a, tr a more kind of, a, you know, take, take the gamble with, you know, or allow individuals to make their own choices about their, the sort of level of risk they're prepared to tolerate, I guess. You know, you could have a regime where individuals had all the information about what the sort of risks were for their particular age groups and pre underlying conditions and stuff. And it was up to them whether they wanted to self-isolate and make sure, do their best not to get it, or whether they, you know, if you were 82 and in a vulnerable group and you know you only have some years left, you might still make the choice to see your grandchildren and for the next few years and just hope for the best. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't, you might reach that kind of big yeah, decision. I don't, I, I, firstly, I don't think you can take uh, an absolutist position uh, on this, um, even if, uh, and I don't myself uh, believe you can be entirely, the state can be entirely uh, uh, neutral on on the, on the choices people make because of the impact of your choices on others, mm. um, which are huge. Uh, the, the state must have a, a keen interest in this. The ability to uh, manage illness across society, to deal with the health impacts and all of that is in this highly contagious and, and utterly deadly disease, obviously, States have to play a role. But in any case, I don't see the policy, the, the best policy, as lying at the two extremes either. I'm very struck by the fact that uh, Austria, Germany and Denmark, what they're looking at is on the basis of testing and what are clearly very low risk groups, starting to open up, but with continuing precautions, uh, including precautions about social distancing while working, while going on public transport and so on. So it is possible to have elements of um, social precaution which uh, limit, possibly significantly limit the spread of the disease without uh, ceasing all economic activity and ceasing all education. So uh, it looks to me as if that's the direction that we're going to go in, at least in this next stage. 
mm. which was starting to make more normal activity possible, but with significant state-mandated precautions, which will have the effect of, of uh, significantly limiting the spread of the disease and the numbers falling fatally. And I think that that is probably the area which we're going to need to be looking at for the next phase, and not the extreme of banning all social interactions on the one side, or thinking that what you do is simply announce that next Monday everything is back to normal, because that clearly isn't where things are at either. So if you're, if you're right, um, this could be with us for a very long time then, it sounds like. Well, I, I, I think having to deal with the impact uh, it, which is going to involve some measure of, of social control. It's going to be with us until we've got a vaccine. That, that's clear because the impact of this is deadly and it's highly contagious. The big question, though, is, um, is how one manages that impact uh, before we've got the vaccine in a way that minimises loss of life and massive detriment to life. Uh, we haven't had to, to make these terrible decisions as a society in any other context in the uh, in the recent past, except possibly to some extent in wars. And that is what we're all wrestling with. And what I hope we can do is have a, a, an open and mature debate based on the facts mm. and absolutely not name calling if somebody says something which uh, somebody else regards as, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, unacceptable in terms of priorities, meaning that you can't have an open discussion about it. Um, do you uh, think we're question, getting that? Suppression of truth is the opposite of science, and we all want this to be science and reason-led, which means getting all of the facts on the table. And, of course, everybody can see in their own daily life the massive impact this is having, even for those people who uh, don't have the misfortune to end up in hospital. So we, we need to consider this in the round. OK, well, final question for you, um, Lord Adonis. Do you think we have the sort of philosophical and moral leadership and you know, thinking in our society. We, we've just come out of this very acrimonious Brexit debate that you yourself were, a, you know, leading part of. We've really kind of turned against each other during the past few years. Do you think we, we will be able to think clearly enough um, and make those kind of momentous decisions about what sort of risks to, to live with um, when we haven't been, been able to think like that for such a long time? Well, in, most, in almost all areas of our life and our public life, we do think like that, actually, including almost all areas to do with, um, to do with medicine and science. Uh, and even on Brexit, um, uh, these were judgment calls. I've, I've never said that Brexit was a totally uh, uh, mad and unsustainable policy. I just thought on the balance of all the arguments, it was, it was not the wise thing to do, including, crucially, looking at what happened internationally. And the, the, the thing that I think is really important, which is why podcasts like this and debates like this are so important, is that, of course, this is global, and therefore we should um, take full advantage of global evidence. Mm. And though everyone is affected, and that's terrible, it also means that everyone's having to wrestle with the same uh, challenges and the same problems. And some are clearly at different stages of it than others. And uh, the only thing I would plead for is that, is that we look with a, an open mind at what other countries are doing including countries which in other respects we regard as just as well-governed, placing just as great a value on life as we do, and be prepared with an open mind to engage with them. And what that means, because I'm a very practical uh, politician and I always seek to try and take the ideology out of this as much as possible, is don't get into either or, one extreme or the other, debates over the next few weeks. Just look really seriously at what is happening in countries that are starting to open up, countries like Austria, like Denmark, uh, Germany is starting to talk about it in a very open way. Yeah, yeah. Look at those very seriously and have an ongoing and serious public debate, including facts as to what's happening. And I think that may make it much, much easier for us to get to the right next stage policy, which everyone accepts is how do we open up whilst minimising the pressures on the NHS, how we do that in a way that carries a broad consensus amongst uh, political people, but also people in society at large. Well, I, this, this debate and this discussion is exactly the kind of thing we need to be doing. And I pay tribute to you personally, Freddie, because you've been looking seriously from your own family connections 
are what's happening in Sweden. Now, most people here think Sweden is a very well-governed country. Indeed, you know, large part of people on, of my political persuasion on the left wish we were more like Sweden. Indeed. So we should absolutely be open to looking at lessons from Sweden, Denmark, Austria, hmm. uh, Germany, when we, when, we, when we tackle this. Well, I hope that happens. Uh, and it's, uh, it's reassuring that um, you are, you're planning to be a leading part of that. You're, you're leaving the kind of Brexit era behind and we're now going into a new, more collaborative and uh, uh, sort of open-minded era, it sounds like. Great to, great to speak to you. And this is going to be an ongoing dialogue. Thank you so much, Lord Adonis. OK, you have been watching Lockdown TV. Um, we are on day number 19, I believe, of lockdown. It is Good Friday. Um, this is a, a Easter special. We've just been talking to Lord Adonis about uh, lockdown and possible ways we might find out of it. Um, we will be back after the Easter weekend on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Thank you for tuning in.